world is not yet ready for all that you will do. Your time will come, Diana. And everything will be different. Citizens of the world! I'm here to change your life. Anything you want. Anything you dream of, you can have it. You'll break your sargos. Diana, look at you. It's like now one day has passed. I don't want to be like anyone. I want to be an apex predator. You've always had everything, while people like me have had nothing. Well, now it's my turn. Get used to it. I've never been one for rules. The answer is always more. fly they will never find us i forgot to tell you what radar will they will they shoot at us barbara what did you do I'm not so keen on this one, I figure uh, you are, but you know what, I'm ready to go. I think we can do better. Parachute pants? Yeah, um... Does, it, does everybody parachute now? Hey everybody, welcome back. You are listening to Joygasm, a video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ, Xbox Live Toaster 360. He is Steve, Xbox Live Stevevich. And we wish everyone a happy new year in episode 206 today, January 1st. 2021. You know, I was listening to our previous Joygasm episode, and both you and Bradley thought that we had one more episode where I could actually say 2020. And I'm here to tell you, Steve, I was correct in my original yeah. proclamation. I thought about that too. I thought I don't know why I said that because uh, my wife was planning on us being together on New Year's and not podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> Though if we had done it uh, last night, then yes, you would have been correct. Fifty but fifty chance, as fate would have it. It 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 decided for us, didn't it? It was just like no. I think that it was a uh, it was a good time to do it, and, and I'm 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 happy about that. I think it's fine, even though technically I did in fact say it one more time. You did. But, you know, whatever. So that makes me right. A happy New Year to you, Steve. <laughs> A happy New Year to you, Russ. Our topic of the day is the Wonder Woman 1984 movie review. We are going to do what we always do when it comes to these films, which is we are going to provide our spoiler-free high-level thoughts of the film before taking the spoiler elevator down to the floor where we will engage in spoiler-specific details and analysis of the film. This is the first time that you and I have watched a brand-new theatrical film not in the theater. Second time. Is it the second time? Well, first was Bill and Ted, Russ. <gasps> I stand, I, technically I'm sitting, I sit corrected, Steve. Right. Thank you for that. Thank you for clearing the air on that. You're welcome. Oh, man. I want to know from you first, what are your high-level thoughts on this film, Steve? Russ, I would say it's probably the opposite of high-level thoughts. It's probably low-level thoughts. <laughs> um, I really, I mean, if if you were to say, what did you think of the year of... 2020. Uh -huh. And then you'd probably get a reaction of like, oh, this year kind of sucked. It wasn't the best year. I'm ready for starting over in 2021. And then you would say, so with that in mind, how would you think, uh, you know, if uh, one of your favorite movies came out 
knowing how the year has transpired, how would it go? And then people are like, oh, man, if there was one good thing that would come out, it would have to be that. And like, but knowing how the year has gone, how would you think it did? They're probably like, yeah, it probably would have sucked. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how it was. I enjoyed like the first 20 minutes of, of it. And, I'm like, and I loved cranking up the volume and thinking, okay, I'm, I'm waiting for this movie for a long time and I've got it on my screen. The bathroom's right there. I got a bunch of candy and I didn't have any candy. I had popcorn. I was going to say, you probably had, had popcorn. I had chocolate raisins. <laughs> Oh, that's good <laughs> from too. From Costco. And um <laughs> <laughs> and so I had my ice water. I probably had a uh, I don't know what else I had. Anyway, I might have had a Dos Equis from uh, dinner leftover. <laughs> Who knows? You lush. <laughs> <laughs> With a little bit of lime. Anyway, stay thirsty, my friends. <laughs> Hey, he's speaking English. And every time I have one, I feel like the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> Well, technically, you do have a beard. <laughs> right. Anyhow, so back to the movie, Russ. Uh-huh. You know, we gave the first Wonder Woman quite a lot of praise. We did. As well as Patty Jenkins. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering how much of that was accurate after watching this one. Mm-hmm. Because I really, I really enjoyed the first one. And I still, to this day, look at Gal Gadot. And I think, man, perfectly cast, 100%. And I, I just, I love seeing her in the role. I just think it's, she's wonderful. But that's pretty much where it ends. I, um, I, it, this movie was like a, a big toss up. I, I thought it was, it could have been a lot better. Mm. It could have been a lot better. <laughs> a lot of it just didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I thought the, I, I don't know where they got the script, honestly. Um, DC's got to figure out what they're doing. I keep on coming back to that every single time. Not, no, okay, I'll take it back. Not every single time. The majority of the time when we're watching a DC flick, it like it's almost the higher percentage that they're going to screw it up, at least for me. <laughs> where it versus like Marvel, we're like, oh man, you see that? That's another good Marvel movie. Another one for the books. You know, I, I really don't, I, I don't have a clue. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know who decided, yes, that's the script we're going to go with. That's perfect. That's exactly how we want to envision Wonder Woman. That's, that's what we want on screen. That's what's going to sell. That I have no idea what they're doing. I have no, I have no freaking clue mm -hmm. what anybody is doing in the movie. Mm -hmm. I know Gal Gadot's supposed to be there because she's Wonder Woman. Beyond that, though, Russ, no clue. No clue. I'm not going to say I hated it, but I could have, I, I felt it could have been tremendously better. Mm. What say you? Well, I believe we are a simpatico to a large extent on this, Steve. I loved seeing Gal Gadot back as Wonder Woman. She, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, she is a perfect casting choice for the character. I also think that Kristen Wiig uh, was the best thing about the film. And she played Cheetah throughout the whole thing. You know, you know when she before she was Cheetah, she was uh, Barbara something or other. <laughs> Barbara, Barbara. But yeah, I mean, and this is not a spoiler because you see little excerpts of it in the trailer, but I mean, the fight scene between Wonder Woman and Cheetah was lame. Um, I, from a high level perspective, I loved the setting of being in the eighties, but it was kind of just like this skin deep uh, didn't experience. Like, like they didn't actually like, why was it in the eighties? Well, <laughs> Who knows? Well, and again, yeah, it's it's like I don't I don't think they really took advantage of the time setting, like because I I mean, I, and I was for it. I think we both were when we first saw the movie trailer and how it was set in the eighties. Like, oh wow, okay, this is cool. I like this idea, but they didn't do anything with the idea. Uh, I thought that the the overall movie was, I would say, okay. It was barely okay though. I was. I was pretty disappointed throughout the movie. There, there were these moments where like I thought were, were really, really well done, but 
they were squeezed by all these other things about the film that made no sense or had plot holes and stuff. Um, one of the things that I will say is I did not appreciate how every guy in the film, except Wonder Woman's love interest was like this misogynist jerk. Exactly. Like this is one of the things that I think Patty Jenkins and just the, the story as a whole failed this time where they succeeded the first time in the first film, you had some of that going on very but, little though, but it was, I mean, even, even like some of, of Chris Pine's characters, you know, Steve Trevor's, his, his little band of, of guys, right? Like you had some that were like kind of idiots and you had others that were arrogant and stuff, but they were still, they were still lovable in spite of their quirks or their flaws or whatever, or being dudes. Right. Right. So, and I think that they, they were, they were also successful th- with other male figures that were in that particular film. But in this film, it was like literally every single guy every that you dude, saw, yeah. it was like this negative experience. And it's like, okay, I want, I want to sit Patty down and say, okay, Patty, there are good men in the world. Like they're, they're, you might have had bad experiences or have poor taste in men, <laughs> but that doesn't mean the majority of them are like that. It, it was it was odd to me that they chose to do that. I understand to a certain extent where like yes, Wonder Woman is this beautiful Amazonian princess, right? Like, of course you're going to have men that will come on to her and will want to ask her out or whatever. That's just the nature of things. Yeah. And that's fine. Like I didn't have a problem with that part of it, but it, it was, it was this constant, like predatorial, hey, how you doing? arrogant, you know, me kind of thing. Oh gosh. Like every guy was a slobbering dog. That's a, that's a good descriptive way of, uh, of putting it for the, for, for the, the most part anyway. But yeah, I, I would say, in a roundabout way that it is a film that kids would enjoy. Like if you want like kind of a, a family film that with the kids who are a bit older, my, my daughter's too young to watch it, but you know, if you wanted something for the, the kiddos who are like 10 years old or older or something like that, they may be into it, but uh, step with me. If you would, Steve into the spoiler elevator, it has been a hot minute since we have been in this Contraption. Yep. You keep that glowy lasso to yourself, Russ. I must say, <laughs> these knee-high Amazonian red boots yeah. accentuate my legs. Those are great boots, Russ. They are indeed. Plenty of breathability, believe yep. it or not. Yep. You know, Steve, if you had a wish, oh, what would that wish be? Oh, I would probably wish because, I mean, I, I can't be the only good-hearted person on the planet. Uh-huh. I would have to wish maybe for some world peace, Russ. Or I'd have to wish for COVID to go away, you know? I, I mean, I can't be the only one that thinks that way. I mean, not everybody in the population has a selfish or terrible wish. You know, come on. Well, but then at that point in time, what would be taken away from you? What would be oh. then stripped away from your benevolent good intentions there, Steve? My hair. That's already been taken away. <laughs> <laughs> Watch it grows back. You're like, this is a double positive. I don't know if that was <laughs> supposed to happen. <laughs> you mean for that to happen? I don't know. Like, oh, yeah, that's just terrible. I'm walking away now. <laughs> <laughs> Head like a chia pet. We are now at the spoiler section of the review. So if you haven't seen the film and you don't wish to hear about spoilers, then we suggest you pause us and go watch the movie first. Otherwise, if you don't care, well, let us continue. So, okay. I have a few notes that I wrote. Do you? Down. Did you write them with a I pencil? Uh, no, I did it with... Ah. Um, well, uh, uh, technically, I didn't write them. I <laughs> typed them. So when it comes to that, it, yeah. it, yes, it don't, don't you worry. I have them typed all out with a lot of TLC. Great. Uh, okay. So let's, 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 let's start with the plot. Jump on that, Russ. Yeah, it's a good place to start. 
So like, like, as you were saying earlier, the plot itself is is pretty thin. Uh, there, there's really yeah. not a lot to it. Essentially, mm. the, the film itself takes place in the 80s, which has been a certain amount of time since World War I, where the first film began. And what's interesting, ugh, interesting is that both B V Superman and Justice League of America, which they didn't actually include the America part. Mm-hmm. Shame on Warner Brothers. You gotta have JLA. It's not JL, it's JLA. That's another issue entirely. <laughs> but when you think of it, those were done more in the modern era, right? Like like in the 2000s. So it's interesting that now we've gone back to the 80s, but I accept that. It's like, okay, not a big deal. The plot itself, though, revolves around the idea that Diana has, is just, you know, she, she has uh, gotten very much used to the, the uh, modern world, modern, you know, world as it applies to the 80s. Yeah. And that there is this, the, the, this new character, Max Lord, um, or Maxwell Lord, who is this, this uh, type of TV personality type. And he is supposed to e- kind of uh, embody the glamorous eighties, like how anything's obtainable. If you put your mind to it, it reminded me a little bit of the Wolf of wall street. Uh, when Leonardo DiCaprio's character was doing some of those like, uh, <laughs> TV personality, uh, motivational speaker type of things. And yet at the same time, we, we are also um, introduced to Kristen Wiig's character who plays Barbara. She will later then become, Cheetah, who's one of Wonder Woman's arch nemesis. So the film, I felt like, like started out fine. You know, I, I thought that the, like you said, the first 20 minutes was actually really enjoyable. We, we are introduced to the idea of being what it's like to be back in the eighties. I was smiling. Honestly, I enjoyed this kind of uh, fast paced cut to cut to cut um, of different things that were all going on. And you got to see how people dressed and what the trends were like the, the power walking or like the knee high. Uh, uh, what do you call them? The, the sweat sock, not sweat socks, but like the, sweat the socks. What, what are those things called that women used to wear? Like the, the warmers uh, for their legs. I guess they're leg warmers. Sure. Russ, the tights or something. Well, no, you remember how like, like they, they would wear like that weird, like leotard, like colorful leotard thing. And then for, on their shins, they'd have these thick like oh, leg warmer right. things. Yeah. I, I don't know. Russ, I, I don't know. Oh, it's, it's I okay. wasn't a part of that scene. It is okay, Steve. It is okay. But anyway, you see like different fashions and trends and interests and just what the culture was into at the time. So a lot of the self indulgencies and that sort of thing. That was totally fine. Like, I, and it did feel authentic to me when I was watching. I was like, yeah, this this is totally eighties. Okay, and I I also enjoyed the um like kind of the mall sequence when Wonder Woman comes in to save the day. But but again, going back to that whole guy thing. Every single person who she protected was a woman. Did you right. notice that? Yeah. It was like literally like it didn't matter if it was a little kid or if it was an adult. It was like saving all kinds of women. I would say the only exception to that would be in the White House when there was a battle going on with Cheetah. And I think there were like one or maybe two instances where she was like, you know, preventing one of the Secret Service men from like, uh, falling really violently and breaking yeah. a bone or something. But for, I mean, I would say 99% of the time it's like woman, woman, girl, girl, woman, girl, yeah. woman, woman, girl. So actually back to that mall scene, did you see how she didn't save or, or didn't punish? I should say, she didn't like have them arrested, but there were, there were girls who were stealing stuff too. And they didn't get caught, Russ. That's very true. Only the boys. That was very true. Yeah, there and actually, yeah, there was a, a particular store where you had girls who were being thieves and they were not held accountable by the Wonder Woman. So, yeah, it, it's kind of an interesting choice there. It wasn't, um, again, you want the audience to, to buy into this world you're creating and believe in it if you know, a certain demographic of your audience feels as though you are unnecessarily demonizing them or picking on them, then you're going to start to lose that portion of the audience. And um, we both feel like the first film did a perfect job of walking that tightrope. So, you know, it just is what it is. Okay. 
I'm just trying to think of like how to like sort all this together because it it was it was there were a lot of holes. There were many holes. The movie was a sieve. A lot, a lot of plot holes in there. Steve, uh, Swiss cheese comes to mind here. Um, let's start out at the beginning, beginning, even before when we get to the 80s. You know, we see young Diana. She's probably like 10 or 12 years old. She's competing in this like triathlon type of thing that the Amazon Warriors are doing, uh, which was really cool. I liked, I liked that whole setup. And the intro was a good life lesson on its own in terms of how they they prevented Diana from winning, saying how we know that you cheated, you went down that little, I don't know, slide. <laughs> um, and I thought, okay, yeah, that's a good life lesson for for kids to to have, and maybe this is going to set the, the the stage for the rest of the film. But really, it didn't strongly connect for me throughout the film's theme. Because in the in the film's theme, it was like like I mean there there's there was a little bit of cheating so to speak, but it was more about obtaining your goal or whatever by any means necessary. Which, yes, it loosely ties into the Diana thing, but I just feel like it was disconnected. Yeah, there, there was a, a disconnection that was there in terms of how when we watched Diana, like she was doing well. And then she was like on the rocks. She saw an opportunity to cheat. So she did. And then she was about to win, but then she had her life lesson versus the rest of the movie where you have Maxwell Lord who never has been successful, which again, and, and that's weird too, because people are calling him a loser and he's not able to have like this oil business thing, take off the ground. He's crazy in debt, but yet he's a TV personality. It's like, wait a minute, you're on TV. Like that is a major accomplishment unto itself that you're on TV. Yeah. He's a and celebrity. TV, yeah. And, and, for, and to be a celebrity means you're making a respectable income. Like if I'm a TV personality, the oil thing suddenly becomes kind of a side gig. Like, yeah, I hope it works out. I hope I can make it work. But but my entire income and family dependency is not exclusive to that. So that was what was kind of weird was like, and then on top of that, like despite him being this fraud, being a loser and everything else, he somehow has intimate knowledge of the dreamstone of the relic. <laughs> yeah. No, but there's no story about where this thing came from or how he knew that knowledge. It was just some random TV personality. It was like, yeah, that's, I know about that. I, I've no history books, no nothing. It was just like, yeah, I found it. I know about it. That's well, it. Yeah. Like, like I, there wasn't any kind of mention of him having a background. I mean, he claimed he knew about anthropology and about, old dig sites and, and ancient cultures, kind of Smithsonian type of stuff. But I mean, I, I just kind of chalked that up him basically lying that he didn't really have any kind of knowledge into that. And that was what was weird too, was that he was coming into the, um, the place where wonder woman worked and where uh, Barbara worked as a partner, like, like an investor, Right. Like, like that was the big thing was like, he was going to be giving them a lot of money. So again, it's like, well, okay. On the one hand, you supposedly don't have any money. And realistically speaking, like if you have someone who's on, who's on TV, they do make good money. Not to mention if they are getting in contact with like the PR department of any given nonprofit organization, they're going to run a background check. They're going to be able to understand. They're certainly not going to just give you all access past to right. all of their inner workings until they've seen the Benjamins. Like it's just weird like how they decided to, to approach that character. The, the character then decides to go on and um, we see uh, how he does eventually come into uh, contact with the Dreamstone, in which case he wishes he wants to actually be the Dreamstone. And that's what starts this whole thing up where uh, he can grant people wishes, but that the wishes are actually cursed. That's a, It's the whole monkey paw thing where if you wish something, your wish will be granted, but then there will be something of great value it's like that a give you, and take you yeah. will lose. Exactly. Now that by itself is fascinating to me. I do think it is an, an interesting notion of 
the idea that you can in fact have a wish come true, but at what cost? And it's not just like, if you look at, look at your life, for instance, like anybody's life, you put um, a certain amount of attention into to having something become a reality, right? But if you make it too much of a focus, how other parts of your life can suffer, this extrapolates that concept out really far in the sense that like, you know, if you say, Oh, I wish I blah, de, blah, de, blah, then you'll then be instantly granted that, but then it will then take something that you didn't realize was actually much more important to you um, until it's kind of too late. And then there is of course the opportunity to renounce your wish, but then people are so obsessed with what they've been able to come into or, or consume or whatever it may be from the wish that they don't want to renounce their wish. Okay. So it, <laughs> It goes back and forth because that serves as the vehicle to have Steve Trevor come back into the movie. And that was one of the things that was interesting when we saw the trailer was we realized, oh my gosh, Steve's back. And we were wondering, how is this possible? How is that happening? And I was going to ask you, what did you think of the setup where it was like she wished to have him come back? His like soul or essence came back, but it was inhabiting the body of someone else entirely. What, what did you think of that? I, I, I was, it took too much brain power to try to figure out what was actually happening. I mean, if, if I was going to wish, it was almost like that, that guy in the beginning who wished for another cup of coffee. It was almost like if instead of him just getting up another cup of coffee, if someone went, Oop, I spilled a cup of coffee into some other person's cup. And then now, oh, now you have a cup of coffee. It wouldn't be like a whole new cup of coffee. But that's almost that kind of ideal that they did where instead of just having the plain wish of, hey, you know what? I wish the one person I fell in love with would be with me again in this time period right now. And then go, poof, here you go. Your wish is granted. And you go, okay, that makes sense. But for some random guy to come in and go, yeah, hey, uh, you know me because of a few lines that probably thousands of people have said before, but I'm going to say them to you again. And then you're going to realize it's me. And uh, well, well, she, <laughs> to her, she saw Steve to everyone else. Not in the beginning, not in the beginning. It was, it, that was not Steve Trevor. I mean, yes, it was Steve Trevor in spirit. And the movie just saw, gave us Steve Trevor because that just made more sense to have like Chris Pine's face instead of this other random guy. But that's why she didn't rec- recognize him. He wasn't he wasn't Steve Trevor who came in at that party, at that little shindig. It was still the dude. And that's why he was looking at himself in the mirror and being like, oh, no, I guess this is supposed to be me. And da, da, da. But in Diana's eyes, it was still a random guy. To us as viewers, it was Chris Pine as Steve Trevor. Right, yeah, we're saying the same thing. Like, yeah. like, like she, wonder. I, I feel like Diana saw, like, like she really did. It wasn't like, a metaphor or anything like that. Like she, she really did see Steve's face on the guy. Like as far as she was concerned, it was Steve because she's the one who made the wish, but to everybody else, it was still that other guy. It didn't look, it wasn't Steve at all. I don't, I no. I think, I think we're, we're seeing mostly the same thing. I think we had to accept that it was Steve Trevor, mm-hmm. but to Diana, because in, in the end of the movie, when she's looking at him, she already knows that that guy is was the body of Steve Trevor. She recognizes him. So if she if if that in fact was Steve Trevor with all his facial features and and body and everything, she wouldn't have recognized him. So we just had to accept that Steve Trevor in spirit inhabited some random guy <laughs> in her neighborhood. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's what it is. I'm like, what? And and the thing is too, if I rewind a little bit more, everybody had to wish something. Out loud. Yeah. Like, I can't just say, I, you know, in my head, my thought of thoughts, I wish I would lose 15 pounds. And then, boof, you know, I would have to say, I wish. And that everybody in the movie did that. Diana did not. She, w- she said it in her mind. And all we saw. She didn't say anything? She did not say anything. I went back in the movie and rewatched it. I'm like, did she say, I, can I, I, did I miss something? Did I yawn oh, wow. really loud and miss it? No, she just held the stone and she closed her eyes and like smiled at, you know, I may be thinking back to. That's right. Yeah, so she didn't say a word. See, that's one of the plot holes is like, 
the stone is not supposed to be telepathic. Like it right. can't, it can't read your mind. You I have cannot to send my thoughts through my fingers into the stone. Yeah. You have to verbally say Ugh. it. Yeah. That's a, that was a good catch. Cause yeah. If we rewind back a little further. Oh, uh, I, I, just, I, I really feel bad for the coffee guy. Yeah. Be, because I mean, what got taken away from him yeah. over a cup of Joe? Yeah. You know, like at least some of these other people who were like, I want to be famous. Yeah. I want lots of money. Well, okay. Well, at least you got that. That guy just wanted a cup of coffee. Yeah, no. I mean, if he renounced his, actually, he might've been the luckiest guy because he was like, yeah, I renounced my wish, but I already drank it. That was a week ago. Yeah. <laughs> coffee is coffee. <laughs> I'll have another cup this week. <laughs> so yeah, that, there's... There, there's a lot there that, that's worth critiquing over. You want to jump into it a little bit, Russ? We well, just, we just, let's point out the pink elephant in the room. Oh. Many of them. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. yeah I, I'm how, just okay. trying to think of like how to like go through. I, I have certain ones that listed out here. Oh, yeah. Do you have the, the flight to Egypt? Russ? Well, I do. I was going to get to that. Um, sure. You know what? Well, well, well let's, let's try and uh, I'm trying to. Okay, fine. Well, let's, who cares? The flight <laughs> to Egypt. Okay. The issue that I have, and I don't know if this is what you're thinking. Maybe Most you have likely else, so. the same, Russ. Okay. Steve Trevor's character was alive during World War One. Right. It was when the art of flight was very much still in its infancy. Mm-hmm. We're not even talking World, World War II. We're talking World War I, right. which happened in the early 1900s. Right. He flew uh, basically like a biplane, you know, something of, of that type of uh, contraption. There is no way that he would instantly know how to fly a jet. That, that looked like a... F-15 or something. No, it wasn't F-15. It was, uh, it, it, it was, it was like, yeah, it was, definitely wasn't an F-15. It was like a, I can look it up, but it's definitely like a longer range fighter jet, but not necessarily a fighter jet. All I'm saying is that thing had electronics. Exactly. Yeah. There was no way that Steve Trevor would know how to turn that thing on, how to fly Within it. seconds. Would, would even know how to maneuver within it because that type of jet is so much faster and maneuverable than a 1917 biplane era thing. Like, you're just like, no. That's <laughs> That completely ruined it for me. I will say, though, Yes. I was happy at the nod toward Wonder Woman's invisible jet, but I feel as though it was like this mixed response because I didn't want it to be in that type of situation where she took a pre-existing jet. Like I always envisioned her jet as like, kind of like this own design, like this exclusive unique design that she has put together that allows her to be able to, use it and fly wherever she wants to go. I don't think it should be dependent upon, oh, I'm just going to camouflage a 1984 fighter jet. Right. Well, also, too, if you want to extend that a little bit further, Russ, so she acknowledged at that at that one scene, like, oh, I learned this before. And he's like, oh, what? how'd you uh, make something disappear? She's like, oh, all I made disappear was a coffee cup. And that was years ago. And then she goes, oh, I think I got it now. And then, like... <laughs> <laughs> puts her hand on the dash uh, or the instrument panel of the, the, the plane. And all of a sudden, just like, no concentration whatsoever. It goes, poof, it's invisible. No problem. Like, mm, stretch. Yeah, it was a little too convenient in terms of just how it rolled out. I think if there was a little bit more of a, a need to focus and struggle to make it work and then have her figure out how to get it to, to manipulate correctly... Yeah, that, that, that would have been nice. Also, too, to see them freak out. Like, if you see the jet that you're flying and suddenly just disappear, you're going to have a moment of panic. Right. And instead, it was just like, oh, okay. They, Sweet. They, they just accepted it and moved on. One of the things about the flight, though, that I did like was I did enjoy when they went through the fireworks. I thought that was like a romantic kind of thing. Romantic, at the, sure. At the same time, it was kind of silly how 
enamored Steve Trevor was. Right. It's like, dude, you had fireworks back in the World War I days. Like, fireworks have been around for hundreds of years. 800 AD. And, and I Googled it. Oh, what, when? 800 AD. So technically, it's been around for over a thousand years. Yeah. You're like, oh, what's this? <laughs> Never seen this before. Yeah. Like, yes, you have. You're right. You're right. I have. Cool. Sh- I've sh- just been dead for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still getting the cobwebs out, you know? But even so, even so, that fighter jet doesn't have the fuel capacity to fly from the Smithsonian and thank goodness, I mean, at least it had a full tank just sitting there on the runway. <laughs> but <laughs> it doesn't have nearly the fuel capacity of like a 747 to make it in one shot very quickly from the Smithsonian to Egypt. Yeah. And then back. Yeah. And record like no time at all. Right. Yeah, that was another thing I had written down was... Um the the continuity was unrealistic in terms of travel in the 80s because they would literally show up in a different part of the world on the same day. I'm like, there's no way that could happen in the 80s. They, did, did, they didn't have that type of technology. I mean, even with Wonder Woman, like if she decided she wanted to Tarzan her way using the lasso of truth to like swing from lightning strike to lightning strike, she wouldn't get there in the same day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I wanted to go back to with regards to Steve Trevor's character, um, I felt it it was weird because like on the one hand, I really enjoyed having his character back, but I also felt like it was a cheat. Like it was this disservice to the character because it took away from him making the sacrifice that he made in the first Wonder Woman that kind of turned him into like this legend in the world of Wonder Woman. Right. To have him come back, even though it was like only through a wish basis and it really wasn't him physically and everything else, they still, for whatever reason, they wanted to bring him back. I understand the desire, though, because Chris Pine is a great actor. Like he has lots of charisma and talent and seeing him with Gal Gadot is a lot of fun. But at the same time, I was just like, yeah, this is... We've already done that. Yeah, we've already been here. We've done that. And and plus, it's just the... the it's weird how they went about it. And I think it was a mistake to, to go with the idea, like you were saying, the notion that he kind of inhabited this, this other dude's body. I think what they should have done was he literally physically, emotionally, mentally, everything, spiritually... Just poof. He materialized and he was there. And the, and then the moment that she renounces her wish, he turns to dust or something like he just falls away. Like, I think that would have made for a much more engaging relationship in the film because the entire time as a movie viewer, I'm watching it. I'm thinking that's some other dude. Like that's not even him. Like, why am I, 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 I I think it's weird. It's it's just kind of odd. Yeah. Anyway, I just had to add in some of those those uh, little little details. So, what else do you have on the list? Let's hear it. <laughs> well, okay. I ha- I have okay. Go. I got oh, I, I, I got one. I got one. I got one geared up here. Uh, man, go ahead, Steve. Okay, so we got uh, Pedro Pascal, Max Lord. Yes. And his limitation is, okay, you get one wish, one wish, Russ, you get one, uno, and that's it. Once your wish is made, that's the only wish you got. You know, for, for, you know, if you might not like it or I might not like it, you only get one wish. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene where he is trying to get like a meeting with the president, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And, and so he's going through all of his newly acquired staff. He's like, hey. Wish for something real quick. You know, you really want me to see the president? He's like, oh, yeah, but you gave me, like, you know, a, a Porsche last week or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and so he's gone through his entire staff trying to make sure that he has not granted a wish for at least one person. And he's stressing out because he's already granted all those wishes. Right. So you take that little nugget of info, and then you they're on the plane to go to this radar site, whatever, and he's in there with Barbara, a.k.a. Cheetah. And she said, he looks at her and says, Hey, you want another wish? 
Yeah. I'm feeling generous. So I was like, okay, well, what was that other scene about then where you were stressing out and panicking because you couldn't grant but one wish? And now it's like, yeah, you dole them out however I feel. At the same time, though, you know what? I don't think she actually wished. Well, no, she said, did she say she wanted to be the apex predator at that point? Or did she say that beforehand when... she said it, her first wish was to be like Wonder Woman, to be like Barbara. Or, I mean, to, to be, to be Diana. like Diana. I'm sorry. Yeah. My bad. So I, her first wish was to be like Diana. And then she's like, I want to be the ultimate apex predator. And then I think she's like, that was on the like, flight. That was on the flight. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's weird too, because it's like, yeah, you, exactly your point. He was freaking out because he needed to find someone who hadn't made a wish yet. And I don't know if that was part of how the stone works. And really, it's it's interesting how you've chosen that because that's next on my list. Actually, was I was I posed the question: Do you think that Max was addicted to giving people wishes? Because it was weird how, on the one hand, he had certain needs that that he wanted met, so he exercised his power to to give people wishes and do the whole monkey's paw thing. But at the same time he exuded almost like this desire or need to want to get more wishes. And I don't know if that was kind of like the personification of the dream stone through him, because like if, if the dream stone relic was in fact a person, they would feel compelled to like try and get more and more people to, to make those wishes because that's part of the curse. And I can, I, you know, I, my mind can get there. It's like, okay, that's maybe that's what it is. Maybe, maybe he was trying to to perform that portion of it where the stone was driving him to want to get more and more wishes. What was interesting, though, well, before I go into that, do you think that, that there was some sort of addiction that he had or, or something along those lines, or do you think it was something else? No, I, I, I don't think it was an addiction. I think that he... He had some medical issue and like he was, he was, he, they made a very brief reference to like his organs failing or something like that. And so he had to kind of get these wishes to, to, to improve his health. Like if you see him on that, that flight, like he's getting all kind of Tony Starkish where the veins are all popping out of his head and stuff. He looks like a pale. Yeah. I remember all of that, but I, but I interpreted those types of symptoms and ailments as a byproduct of him giving or granting more and more wishes. It might've been the same thing, but they also said he hadn't been sleeping in a long time too. But then shortly after part of him granting all these wishes was he was like taking different multiple things from other people, but improving his health. Like he looked really good when he At was the on end, camera. Yeah, yeah. Like, like he, he was, he was certainly doing that. It was almost like this weird pyramid scheme thing or a Ponzi scheme, I guess I should say where right. like he was, you know, the people's wishes were causing more and more of his physical self <laughs> to, to suffer and get worse. But then at the same time he was countering it by, the same exact wish. And yeah, it, it, it was, uh, I, again, the idea by itself is not a bad one. Um, but at the same time, I just don't think it was executed correctly. Well, yeah, but plus also too, the technology, you, you had to, he had to touch somebody. Like he had to grab him by the shoulder. So there's physical contact and say, you wish this for me, right? And they're like, yeah, I do. I wish that you're <laughs> touching me really aggressively right now. Yeah, you know, let go of my shoulder. Mind my personal yeah. space. <laughs> yeah, six feet apart. Yeah. So, um, but then when he, uh, he grants the president a wish, he's like, oh. What's all this technology? <laughs> and like, oh, well, that guy uh, just beams a TV signal to broadcast on an ACRT screen anywhere in the world. Whatever you want to broadcast, no matter if it has a tuner in it or not, it'll broadcast. And he's like, okay, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, touch. He's like, wait a minute. I can touch somebody with this invisible beam particles Particles. or something like that. He's like, yeah. Sort of. Not really. (laughs) He's like, got it. Kind of a physical impossibility. (laughs) But let's roll with it. Why not? Uh, One of the other issues that I had with the film was that there was hardly any fighting. Yeah. Wonder Woman didn't really do that much. Again, we saw at the beginning in the mall sequence, which was fun. Like, I liked seeing what she was doing. It It was was campy. Yeah, it was campy. It was campy, but it was intentionally campy. And it's like, okay, I can get behind that. That was fun. It doesn't, you know, the the whole movie doesn't have to be all stoic and super serious and stuff. So it's like, okay. Um, 
I, I just thought how, I'm sorry to cut you off. She was just, you know, taking out all the security cameras to keep it all hidden and telling people like, Shh, you know, don't tell anybody this happened. Yeah, she's wearing like these bright colors, you know, like, was it red, blue, and gold, you know, and she's like showing a lot of skin at the same time. Like, you cannot get a crowd full that would fill a mall to not talk about it to anybody. Like, word's definitely going to spread. <laughs> She's representing Steve. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The other sequence what, that I actually did like was in the White House when the fight did ensue between Wonder Woman and Cheetah. And that was the first time that we really saw how Wonder Woman was losing her powers. Mm. Now, this is a component of the film that I really liked. I liked exploring the idea of what if Diana was started to lose her powers because she's the daughter of Zeus. So to see her becoming more and more in a vulnerable state and especially to see her bleed like to that was cool. I liked that, especially when I, I like that. Uh, thank you, Joker. I liked when they were in Egypt, for instance, and, and you st we started to see that where it's like, whoa, or like she was not able to hold on to her lasso and she fell down. I, I knew instantly something was up. I was like, whoa, that does not happen. Something's wrong. And that was one of the positives for me in the film. I, I did enjoy that. And I liked the idea of the setup between Wonder Woman and Cheetah just because Cheetah is essentially a carbon copy of Diana, except it's... <laughs> she's a cat from the play. Exactly. That's where the apex predator kind of thing kind of comes in. Um, but anyway, I, I did. I wish to be a leopard. <laughs> I think they have the ultimate lifestyle. <laughs> They're pretty exotic, you know, live in the jungle. <laughs> well, and in the comic books, like that, there is a lot of jungle goodness to be had, but Anyway, did you think that that actually was pretty cool to see Diana in a more of a vulnerable human weakened state like that, where she suddenly had to think about it and be careful and rely on, on other things than her brawn? I did, but they, I think they did it wrong. I, Cause if I, if I'm the monkey's paw and I say, wish for something, you say, I wish you were wearing a jacket instead of a sweater. And I'll say, okay, but I'll take away your microphone. Suddenly, you don't have a microphone to speak in. It's not like I'm dragging it closer and closer to my to, to me, right? I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm. It's 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 one action. It's instantaneous. It's instantaneous. And so she was like slowly losing her power. Like some at some point she had it. At some point she didn't have it. Like you know when it was when, a gradual weakening. I mean, yeah, it was. But like for example, in Cairo, or I don't know whether they were in Cairo. I just said Egypt. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Like when she uh, she completely flips up this armored truck, and then all of a sudden she can't even like push up push away another vehicle, and so it was there, and then it wasn't there, and then it was back, and then so it was kind of a push. It was kind of a tug of war with what she had. I did. I don't know for some reason I did like the approach of how it was not instantaneous though, because again it it, was, it served as more of a a journey for the, for the movie viewer to discover that she's losing her powers. And also too, I think by, by her, cause she's not just human, right? Like, like she definitely, she's supernatural. So that didn't bother me as much. Yes. If you look at continuity in terms of like the humans with, you know, that all their stuff would happen immediately. I didn't mind that. And I actually, I think that it introduced more of a sense of dread with her character. Because when she's in Egypt, for instance, like that was kind of the beginnings, right? Where all of a sudden you realize, oh, wow, she's bleeding or, oh, she, you know, did these little things. She she struggled to push those two uh, vans apart, but she still did versus when she's in the White House and she's way more weaker there than she was in Egypt. And, and that was, we're supposed to believe kind of uh, probably within like a 24 hour period. So it wasn't like months have gone by and she's still weakening. Like it, it was, it was going on a pretty consistent clip, I would say. Yeah. Uh, to me, I think that the, the movie could have been deeper if she just lost all her powers and then she really had to dig deep herself going, how am I going to solve this problem? Mm -hmm. And said, she just told it, she still relied on her powers and yeah, they didn't go all the way completely, but it's almost like, um, like a black Panther in a, in a sense where he lost his entire abilities and he had, 
he had to figure it out. Okay, I have to. I literally have to base what I know about fighting and play a game of chess in a way with the other person to see who's the better man. Now that my powers are gone, and he had he got to humble depths. But Diana, on the other hand, like, oh, you know, you, your powers are there, but they're getting weaker and weaker and weaker. She never lost them completely, and so therefore she was never a mortal human. Yeah. And so she was still above regular humanity throughout the the rest of the film. And that, at the end, she didn't really learn that much. So it was almost like a waste of time. Well, maybe the monkey's paw just decides how much it wants to take away. Yeah, okay. You know, let's just assume a bunch of stuff. I mean, you know, it's a movie. Whatever. You know, let's just assume everything. <laughs> hey, rules for them, rules for us. Rules for them, rules for us. <laughs> <laughs> Keep track of all the rules, Ross. What did you think of the relationship between Maxwell Lord and his son? Um, I thought it was a bit, I mean, it was fine. It was a bit cliche. I thought his son was, even though he was a cute kid, cute I thought, kid for I, sure, I thought yeah. it was totally miscast. Like he didn't, he didn't at all look like his dad at one bit. And you know, I know they, they try and at least do that so they can show that. And he wasn't adopted, right? Like they never he, made he any, in, to, yeah, I didn't hear them say, I mean, maybe they did and I totally missed it. I, I interpreted it as, as based on what little that Maxwell said, it sounded like um, that, that was like, like he was the biological father of that son. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. But having said that though, I thought the kid did a great job. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I felt like the, the kid um, did a great performance and, there was, I felt like there was some heartfelt moments. I know as, as a parent, the, the toward the end there, when, when the, uh, when Maxwell realizes what truly matters is, is to get back to his son and getting to his son and how a son just loves him for being his dad and that sort of thing. Um, that pulled up my heartstrings a bit as a parent. Like I think like when you become a parent, like those scenes that normally would just be like, whatever as a kid or, or as a single adult, like suddenly you're like, <laughs> so uh, was very uh, interesting uh, throughout how the the whole film went. But uh, did you have any other issues with the film, Steve? Oh, I got plenty of issues with the film, Russ. I mean, uh, towards the ending, any big ones though? We don't have to like go to every single little dinky. Um, one. I mean, ultimately, regardless of her powers, Wonder Woman really just didn't seem like Wonder Woman. It didn't seem like. It was a movie about Wonder Woman. It seemed more of a movie about Steve Trevor, honestly, than it did about. I, I really didn't feel like we got a honest Wonder Woman film. Mm. I feel like Wonder Woman was in this film, but it was more about other figures than her. Yeah, doesn't it feel like that to you? Because it looks like she couldn't even had a film by herself unless Steve Trevor was there. Well, I, I didn't feel that. I, I do agree, though. I don't think again. With her being Wonder Woman, the scenes where she's actually Wonder Woman are very few and far between. Uh -huh. There really are, and again, that that's one of the the comments I made earlier about how there really is hardly any fighting in this this film. Even when it gets to kind of the climactic battle where you we we see Cheetah and all of her glory for the first time, the the fight was okay. Yeah, I liked how it started. But at the same time, I just, I really wanted to see more of a knockdown, bare knuckle, dragged out, like vicious fight. And it really, there really wasn't that. Um, in fact, despite the, the sheer volume of additional wishes that Max Lord was like putting onto her before she fought Wonder Woman, I mean, that really should have been much more epic of a battle. Oh, than what yeah, we saw. easily. And then when she has the, the lasso around his ankle when she was like really trying to throw it at him and like just couldn't get past the breeze. Yeah. I guess the it was field. Even, well, I mean, I, if you want to call it a force field, I mean, it really wasn't, it was high winds, but they weren't high winds in a way. Like well, they, they were blowing paper around, but it wasn't near like a tornado or a windstorm. But again, it was, it was a supernatural wind. It basically Max Lord Taylor was taking on so many wishes simultaneously that he was essentially becoming very powerful and able to like True. wield some sort of supernatural power. Right. But what I'm going to allude to is like, she's really trying to whip that lasso around him. And then she gets knocked to the floor and on her back, she's able to whip the thing like well, whip of the wrist 
<laughs> and it's able to, unbeknownst to Max, unbeknownst to us as the viewer, lasso quite a few times around his ankle mysteriously. Yeah, that, and then, that was bad. Like she can communicate with everybody on the planet speaking English. <laughs> and somehow everybody on the planet understands English. What's well, you it was say? like she know. was using him as a conduit t- for the yeah. whole thing. But uh, <laughs> the issue with that, again, <laughs> I don't I don't have a problem with her using him as a conduit since he was being a conduit for the the actual broadcasting systems. Like, OK, my suspension of disbelief can accept that. What well, my <laughs> suspension of disbelief cannot get past is exactly what you described about how we saw her in earnest attempt again and again and again to lasso him. And it just failed miserably. It could not get past the invisible force field of wind and everything else that was going on. Yet while you said like, like, you know, to your point, while she slumped onto the ground, she has a little flick of the wrist that we apparently don't see. And she's able to, to wrap it around him again. I can't, I can't accept that. It, it, it's that's where you go into the cheesy eye rolling. That's too convenient. Dare I say lazy script writing. It's like, you've got to come up with a different way to make that happen. So what are the, what are the pieces you have on your list there? Russ? Well, the, I, I've covered the main ones the, and I think that they kind of carry into some of the smaller areas, but, and, and I, and I don't want to make the entire thing us just bagging on the film because there were some, some redeemable aspects to it. Like for instance, the soundtrack, I thought Hans Zimmer did a fantastic job with the new material in the movie. Like there was, there were multiple times when I would turn to my wife and would be like, man, this music's really good right here. So that's definitely a great thing to be had. Um, and I, and I also enjoyed a lot of the, the, the actual visuals themselves, you know, it, despite the fact that the plot just was just all over the place and had holes everywhere, visually speaking, like it was like, man, like this is, this makes my eyes happy. This is, this is really fun to be in the eighties and to see wonder woman and that sort of thing. I also liked, um, some of the other things that they were playing around with, with how like she could use her uh, tiara as like a, a weapon to and, and utilize different things like that. I thought her golden eagle armor was awesome. I loved the idea behind the kind of the, the legend of the armor. How like there was this this other Amazonian who uh, sacrificed herself for the rest of the the woman warriors to escape against all the 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 men, the male brutes or whatever, you know, Some, oh yeah. <laughs> entire Spartan male race. Yeah. I was going to say, it looks like a scene out of 300, uh, except they're only attacking one woman. Uh, the symbolism of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, but I, again, I thought that even like the, the flashback was really cool. She looks great. When, when Gal Gadot had the armor on, she looked amazing. Like I thought it was a, a really nice change up from her standard outfit Again, design-wise, you know, the costume designs and stuff, that was fantastic. It was awesome. But it was like five seconds. Like, she flew in. They're like, oh, this armor is awesome. All right. And we get it. We're like, oh, man, stuff's about to get real here. And then Cheetah claws off her armor and then she Not takes all of the, it. She oh, was clawing well, off parts. I mean, like the basically like what we like the golden feathers. And so the arm that was useless. So she hucks that off. And then it's basically her in the golden like chain mail sort of thing. And then she really didn't need it. She was just, she had all her powers back. So it was like, why are we just doing this in the first place? She didn't need the armor to fly. Well, it, so I thought about that and it's because why is that Ross? So according to what we saw happen, according to legend, she had was actually, she was supposed to be stronger than wonder woman, even after she had gotten her powers back because her first wish was to actually be just like Diana. Mm -hmm. Then after that, she wanted to be the apex predator. And so then he granted a wish. Then, then when he got connected to the, the broadcasting system or whatever, she wasn't even asking for wishes. He was just giving them to her. He was like taking people's wishes. If you noticed, and he was passing them over to cheetah. So, I mean, she should have been this absolutely incredible, ferocious adversary for wonder woman to take on. And we just didn't see that type of fight, which we've already covered. 
Do you have any other comments? Because if you don't, Steve, I suggest we go into IMDb. Go into IMDb, Russ. Movie trivia courtesy of IMDb. Uh, let's see here. Lily Aspel, or Aspel probably, Lily Aspel. She was the uh, uh, young Diana at sure. the beginning of the film. Yeah. Performed all the required physical stunt work herself Ooh. at the age of 12 because it was deemed that she did the job better than her own stunt double. Her own 12-year-old stunt double? Stunt double? They have stunt doubles <laughs> for every age. Hi, am I here to turn in my application for a stunt double? Oh, sweet. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Stick with us, kid. You're going to be a star someday. <laughs> Go hang out near that box of dynamite. We'll be right with you. <laughs> Gal Gadot's family and Patty Jenkins and son have a cameo at the end of the film. Gadot's elder daughter and Jenkins's son throw a snowball at her and Gadot's younger daughter and husband appear on the carousel. I wondered if that was in fact mm. somehow uh, a cameo of sort. The role of Sheeta was first offered to Emma Stone, but she declined. The role was then offered to Kristen Wiig, Patty Jenkinson's first choice, which I'm actually really happy about because I think, again, Kristen did a fantastic job. Like, like she brought, a, like, she was like the only new character in the film that brought depth and realism. Like, one of the things that we didn't discuss uh, was I, I did like, kind of the, this full loop of like how she was walking home before she became cheetah and how that guy started harassing her, that drunkard um, fool and how, um, you know, he threatened her and all this kind of stuff. And, and then once she was as strong as Diana, then she was able to fend for herself. And I also thought it was fascinating. This is actually one of the high points for me in the film. I liked how they explored how she defended herself physically to a certain point, but then, overextended it and, and went too far where it was no longer her defending herself. Now she was actually attacking an injured person because it was out of spite and she enjoyed the power and she was bullying to the point where, I mean, she could have killed him if she wanted to. And that, that um, homeless man who came out, who she knew um, beforehand was able to kind of bring her back to her senses that was actually a really cool scene, but that's just one example of like how, I and mean, you remember Kristen Wiig, she comes from Saturday night live, right? She's a comedian like this. She, in my opinion, she did a really nice job. Anyway, moving on the role. Da, 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 da. Okay. As first reported by variety actress, Gal Gadot was paid $10 million for this film, which she also produced, which is by the way, Steve, is 33 times more than what she made on the first film, Wonder Woman, in 2017, in which she earned $300,000. Well, that's definitely well earned. I mean, she was way underpaid for the first movie. Yeah. And way overpaid for this movie. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm singing it as a balance out. I'm, I mean, so she's... She she, she, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't have a, an issue with it at all. This is just, just movie trivia. Yeah. Asteria's gold armor is based on the armor Wonder Woman wears in Alex Ross graphic novel Kingdom Come. Ross commented in an interview that he was upset the studio did not compensate him for using his design in other media besides comics. Hmm. Interesting. Little shady business dealings yeah. going on there. Got to always protect your creative output there. Right. Hans Zimmer had previously announced that he would retire from composing for superhero films after I'm Batman v Superman, this. Dawn of Justice in 2016, <laughs> which featured Wonder Woman's cinematic debut and teamed her up with Batman and Superman, whose films he had already composed scores for. However, he accepted to compose the score for X-Men Dark Phoenix in 2019 and now will return to compose for Wonder Woman 1984. <laughs> okay. You know, I saw that live. I know you did, Russ. I Life know changing, you did. I tell you, Steve. Life changing. <sighs> Diana uses her tiara as a boomerang. This was a feat she performed in Wonder Woman, the TV show of 1975. After she visited Australia. Patty Jenkins <laughs> picked the 80s as the film setting because she saw it as the height of Western civilization and society. And so it offers the opportunity to explore how Wonder Woman would deal with the types of villains that come from that era. Men. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> In 
the film, Maxwell Lord is a human who acquires the power to make wishes his own and others come true through a magical relic. In the comics, he acquired the power to persuade people to mm. carry out his slash their own wishes caused from an alien invasion oh. in 1988 to 1989. Yeah. Does it say anything in there about Cheetah and the comics, Russ? Because I believe... Now, I'm a bit rusty here, Russ, because I mostly just watch the cartoons, but I believe Cheetah became Cheetah because she was cut by a cursed Amazonian blade. I could be totally wrong, but I am staying true to my gut on that, Russ. You may be correct, Steve. I do not have that information readily available for you, Steve. Yeah, I got a deep index of cartoons. So, uh, <laughs> we all know how much of a student of Wonder oh, Woman you are. Man. Well, anyway, that is all of the movie trivia I was able to conjure up courtesy of IMDb. In conclusion, I think it's just fair to say that this film was, was a disappointment. Um, I think it depends on who it is that you talk to. For me personally, I think that there were moments of brilliance throughout the movie, but they were too few and far between in what is otherwise a very convoluted uh, plot hole driven film, a little too much campiness, a little too much cheese in it. And I, it does, it does shake me a little bit in terms of, of my confidence in Patty Jenkins. Mm. That's not to say anything bad about her as a person or a character or anything else like that. Just her ability. Looking at, at, at her creative direction. Um, yeah. Like the first, again, the first film was just, it was a great film. Uh, I really love that film. In this film, I just, I want to know, why she chose some of those decisions. And if you recall, she's going to be working on some sort of star Wars. I don't know. I can't remember if it was like a standalone film for the theaters or if it was a Disney plus thing. I'll have to look back on that, but it, it does make me a little concerned about, okay, (laughs) is she going to be able to pull this off correctly or not? I mean, and, and I understand, you know, I look at Patty Jenkins. I could see why Kathleen Kennedy knowing like what Kathleen Kennedy is into, why she would approach, Patty Jenkins to um, direct this sort of thing. I mean, it really checks off the boxes for, for her personally. I just, I hope it's good. <laughs> you going to give us a rating, Russ? I think for Wonder Woman 1984, I'm going to give it two stars. Mm. I didn't think it was an, a, a complete train wreck of a film, but I do think that it was subpar. I do think that there there needed to be uh, a substantial amount of fixings throughout this. As it was almost like this was like the first draft of the script and they needed to go through multiple iterations to make sure everything made sense. I did enjoy seeing Gal Gadot again. I always love seeing her in Wonder Woman. I think she is Wonder Woman. I applaud Kristen Wiig for her portrayal of Cheetah. You know, even Pedro Pascal, who... Quite honestly, I, I I couldn't like fully embrace his character. Uh, I still like him as an actor. I think he, he has a. I mean, I, I, well, I almost gave something away. <sighs> Glad I put on the brakes there, Steve. He's a man of many ta- many talents. I'll put it that way, Steve. And the music again, the soundtrack was terrific. It was very inspiring. It's just that if I were to compare the, the first Wonder Woman movie, which honestly, I think I gave somewhere, I think I want to say 4.5 or five stars too. And I think you did somewhere in that vicinity as well. I think that, that this is two stars for me. I would have to agree with you there, Russell, on the two stars. I think this, um, for the most part was a waste of a lot of folks, talent and ability. Um, I think this movie should have came right to like DVD. Honestly, I think if, if I went to see the movie in the theater, I uh, would have not nearly been as happy as I am right now, Russ. And I'm happy. I just don't really care for the movie. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm I, happy guy. <laughs> I'm happy guy. I'm just complaining a lot about this. So, yeah, I mean, I I really didn't know what they were they were doing with it. They had a lot of time to work on it. I mean, all of 2020, no, 
movie studios weren't working on anything. They were postponing until 2021. So uh, I think if they went back and looked at it and said, you know what, we could really do better here. Um, maybe we should. And it seems like no one asked that question. It seemed like Warner Brothers and DC went, okay, we got the Warner Brothers fan or the uh, the Warner Brothers fans. We got the Wonder Woman fans. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, you know the logo does look like her golden eagle yeah, armor. Exactly. There, Steve. So we got all the fans on deck and we got them uh, by the ghoulies. Let's just throw out another movie to them. And they'll all go and see it. And that's what it really felt like. They didn't feel like they gave us a quality Wonder Woman film. It, it, it felt like they gave us something else to spend our money on is really what it felt like. Yes, I love seeing Gal Gadot on screen. I will definitely go see another Wonder Woman movie just to see her on screen. I, I mean, she she is Wonder Woman. But that being said, the majority of everything else, I mean, I, I want to be entertained. I want I want a good story. I want to get behind all the characters. I want to love the villains too. And I walked away thinking that, I'm glad I did. I really didn't put my mind in the movie too much. I'm glad I put it at the door. I'm glad I, I watched it at home. Um, but no one I've spoken with so far was like, yeah, this movie was awesome. You know, this is, it, I don't know. I really feel like it, it was a wasted effort and I'm, I'm still concerned with DC, what their plan is, what yeah. like, they got a lot of trouble. I don't, I don't know what to think about Patty Jenkins anymore because on one side of the scale, she did an incredible job. On the other side of the scale, she totally screwed it up. I, that's what I feel like. I'm being transparent. So, I mean, Star Wars to me, nowadays, I mean, know what to think of Star <laughs> Wars. So I, if she screwed, I mean, Star Wars, you can't really screw up any more than it already is. Mandalorian is a good, I mean, from like the two episodes that I've seen in Mandalorian, they have taken a step in the right direction, so they can oh, recover. Dude, Man they Man they Man Mandalorian is legit, but that was directed by John Favreau. Which oh, boom! Iron Man. Yeah, Johnny Favs. Yeah. So, I mean, yes, there can be recovery and there can be healing, but my goodness, I don't want to be concerned with this the the this fiction that I've I've loved so much since my youth, Russ. I want to see this. I want to spend money on it, not because I just want to see a character on screen, but because they're doing the story and the comics justice. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> and I just don't feel like that's happening, especially in the DC universe. So, yeah, I, I would say no higher than a two. I mean, a 1.5 seems too low. I didn't hate it. It just really felt subpar. It really felt... Well, it, it, I think because the first film was so successful... And it's in its execution. I think that, that everybody was expecting it to be on the same level, if not even better, because they had more of a budget. They had more time. They knew what, what they had set up. And yeah, there, there's a, there, what would, I just didn't I know what they did with the script. I think if they even had a better script, what we saw on TV. Well, and I think you brought up something that is also worth noting here in conclusion. And that is that I think DC and Warner Brothers are really struggling to come up with memorable villains. Because if you recall, like the one of the very few critiques that we had in the first Wonder Woman film was the the villain who was like that that old that old British man, the, the, the gay yeah. British man <laughs> with, with the, the mustache. mustache. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to throw a tank at you. Uh, don't worry. I, I'm in my, my old uh, uh, armor, which should make me look a little more imposing. Boo, are you scared? <laughs> you take this, you scallywag. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we went from that to then Max Lord... Uh, who, quite honestly, was not that threatening, right? And then even with Cheetah, like Cheetah, I I was I was ready and willing to buy into that she was a, a physical threat, but they didn't capitalize on it enough. And when I think of even some of the other films, like Batman is one of the exceptions. Like Batman has a whole treasure trove of well, very well thought out villains. I mean, even Superman has Lex Luthor that uh, is great to watch. Right. So it is. What's well, it? I mean, it's interesting you bring up Batman because, like, Barbara's story is essentially Catwoman's story. If you, I mean, you could draw a very close parallel. Kind of. Yeah. Well, it, well, okay. To be fair, though, that was the Tim Burton vision or sure. of Catwoman, which sure. was not. Uh, it was not the same as as to her origin story in the comics. Even either way, 
I give you that. Fine. I, I can give you that. But it's a little a version, slinkiness, though. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We've already seen that version play it on TV and then we're on and then we're playing it again. That wraps up this episode of Joygasm. Make sure you tune in next week. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out patreon.com slash joygasm, which is spelled J-O-Y. G-A-S-M and consider becoming a monthly contributor. You'll get exclusive perks and early access to the show. Not to mention, it really helps us continue doing what we love to do. Also, you can follow us on social media and YouTube. Just do a search for Joygasm TV. Last but not least, search Joygasm TV on Twitch to see us stream our gaming adventures live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. We will see all of you next week. <laughs>